With a new episode released, we are back with another breakdown video of the ongoing second season for the famous video game-inspired TV show, Halo. In the first two episodes of Halo Season 2, we witnessed an escalation in Covenant activities, particularly in their aggressive conquests of planets. Amidst Master Chief's evacuation mission at Sanctuary, encountering approximately 50 Covenant soldiers, he was taken aback by the unexpected appearance of Maki, who had supposedly died at the end of Season 1. To further validate his suspicions, Maki, accompanied by a Sangheili soldier, infiltrates Reach to acquire a fragment of the Keystone artifact. Meanwhile, despite Master Master Chief's warnings, Ackerson, Hal sees a replacement, dismisses his concerns against the Covenant and sidelines Silver Team. Not just that, Ackerson even conducts clandestine experiments on Cortana and Halsey in an undisclosed location on Reach. And even though Chief was benched, he planned an unauthorized mission to verify Cobalt Team's encounter with the Covenant. Simultaneously, tensions rise into rubble as Soren's team suspects him of withholding a substantial bounty for Madrigal, prompting them to betray him to the UNSC. Meanwhile, Quan Ha, who is now living in the rubble caverns, becomes aware of the unfolding situation and grows apprehensive. Now, the opening scene of Halo's third episode titled Visigrad is dark as hell, as John, aka Master Chief, and the crew embark on the next part of the story from the previous episode's cliffhanger. I found myself squinting like a grunt facing the blinding sun right before its head gets brutally taken off. While the occasional almost pitch black scenes in this episode gets a bit frustrating, Visegrad wisely brings the series' various plots closer together instead of letting them linger separately. Despite some debatable story decisions, there's plenty of good stuff to unpack in the latest installment of the Halo series. So without wasting another second, let's get right to it. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you, and let's begin. Effective immediately, Silver Team is suspended from combat operations till further notice. Master Chief goes rogue on an off-book mission and gets his whole crew suspended. We witness Master Chief leading Kai, Riz, and Vadek towards Visegrad, believing it to be the location where a Cobalt Team clashed with the Covenant. Just outside the relay, Chief tells his team that they're operating off-book and completely isolated, as UNNC Command and Ani refuse to acknowledge the Covenant threat on Reach. The rest of the Silver Team appears apprehensive as they cautiously approach the relay. As soon as they hear the sound of static interference, similar to what they heard in Sanctuary, it strongly suggests the Covenant's presence. However, upon reaching the facility, they find it strangely deserted. Further adding to the confusion, UNSC Fleet Command soldiers under Briggs' command intercept the Spartans and order them to abandon the mission and return to headquarters, citing Master Chief's unauthorized actions, breaching protocols. Despite Master Chief's attempts to prove his point, there's insufficient evidence to support the Covenant's presence at Visegrad. Naturally, Admiral Jacob Keyes reprimands Master Chief for his actions and reveals that Cobalt Team was actually dispatched to Atkis IV, not Visegrad. He accuses Master Chief of being delusional when Chief accuses Ackerson of treachery. But the Admiral doesn't buy it and puts the entire team on leave, stripping the Silver Team of all their privileges. The rest of the Silver Team have it out with Chief, including Kai, who expresses her doubt in him after claiming he saw the supposedly dead Covenant Blessed One Maki on Sanctuary. Chief clearly loses control of his unit at that moment because Riz, Kai, and Vadek feel betrayed by his lack of transparency and distance themselves from him. Well, I can't take you with me. We see a different side of James Ackerson. Well, it is revealed that Colonel James Ackerson has a father whom he is looking after, struggling with some form of dementia, likely Alzheimer's. Quite a lot of things are revealed in this scene as Ackerson painfully explains to his father that he has to leave and can't bring him along. The elder Ackerson, despite his condition, recalls that his son once told him about an impending catastrophe. He then reminisces about a childhood memory of accidentally urinating on his brother and how they later grew up together to construct some of the most significant significant structures on Reach, notably a bridge which tells us how both Ackerson's uncle and father were architects at Reach. Mr. Ackerson then fondly remembers walking his family, his wife, James, and James's sister, Julia, across the same bridge. When he becomes too excited to see his wife and daughter, James gently reminds him that they have passed away. Initially frustrated and angry, his father eventually calms down and before Colonel Ackerson leaves, his father makes him promise not to let the Covenant capture him. On a side note, we find out that Julia, the girl who appeared in Halsey's simulation in the previous episode, is actually Ackerson's late sister. After learning that his son is leaving, 
leaving, the only wish Ackerson's father has for his son is to grant him peace before he leaves. Ackerson appears to agree, understanding that a peaceful end would be preferable to the miserable life his father is currently enduring. It's not personal. It is! <laughs> Trouble in the rubble. Now, Sorin 066 still remains missing, leaving his wife, Lara, engulfed in growing anxiety. One day, while walking through the rubble streets, Lara is suddenly grabbed, but the assailant turns out to be Quan Ha, Sorin's former comrade who has been hiding in the rubble. Quan Ha, who has now formed a clandestine bond with Lara and Sorin's son, Kessler, urges her to leave the planet immediately with Kessler. He warns her about Ruby Ann, who is likely a pirate and has seemingly bought the allegiance of Antares and Karina. They plan to pressure Lara and Sorin's absence until she reveals the location of the bounty from Mandrigal. Following this, when Lara confronts Antares and Karina, they deceitfully claim that the ship has been repaired before time so they can all resume their mission to rescue Sorin. They ask Lara to board the ship with the intention of imprisoning her instead. In a bold move, Lara invites them to begin boarding their ship, assuring them she'll join shortly. Being caught off guard, Antares and Karina reluctantly comply, giving Lara, Kessler, and Quan Ha the opportunity to escape. So Quan Ha and Lara devise a plan to seize Sorin's ship and flee. During their discussion, Quan hints at a tragic event that diverted her from her duty of guarding the portals to Halo, leaving her in an existential quandary about her next steps. Apart from that, Quan subtly reveals that while four ships attempted to evacuate Madrigal during a Covenant attack, only one succeeded and upon reaching the rubble, refugees are treated as indentured servants. Despite her sorrow over failing to protect her planet, Quan is determined to shake off her despair by rescuing Lara and Kessler, as she believes that's the least she can do for Sorin. The two women then seize an opportunity when the docking crews and pirates are preoccupied, sneaking aboard Sorin's ship with Kessler and attempting to flee. However, their escape plan is thwarted by Antares and Karina, and the pirates manage to seal the bay doors just before Lara can take off, prompting her to sacrifice herself to the traitorous pirates while allowing Quan to escape with Kessler. We need to be in the fight. I'm not going to change my decision. The Silver team members are clearly struggling, so Ackerson opts to send two seemingly puny guys to escort Master Chief to his office, a decision that unfolds in a rather humorous and unsurprising manner as Master Chief effortlessly incapacitates each of them with single blows. This scene cleverly subverts the typical action genre trope where protagonists engage in gritty and exhausting elevator fights, highlighting Master Chief's Spartan capabilities as he dispatches these guys with ease. Amidst the chaos, Riz seeks solace with Louis and visits him while he is on a date. It is then revealed that Luis and Danilo are romantically involved. Riz unintentionally interrupts their date night, but sensing her distress, they graciously invite her to join them for dinner, and they collectively discuss what her other options could be apart from being a Spartan. Despite the apparent subtlety in Natasha Kulzak's performance, she impeccably captures Riz's character, who is navigating unfamiliar territory as she opens up for the first time. Unused to affection and care, we see Riz struggle to even grasp the simplicity of sharing a meal with her newfound friends. In a separate conversation with Ackerson, Kai pleads for the cancellation of their suspension, arguing that Spartans are not meant to be sidelined. She then expresses her inability to witness Master Chief in his current state and urges Ackerson to reinstate them and allow them to fulfill their duties. Kai even offers to lead the Silver Team until Master Chief is reinstated. However, Ackerson drops the bombshell that Chief had overpowered his guards and escaped. He scrutinizes Kai to find out if she is helping Chief in any way, then adopts a gentler approach, suggesting that Chief's mental state may be deteriorating, even hinting at potential dementia. Though he must be speaking from personal experience, Ackerson's emotions seems to cloud his judgment regarding Master Chief and for obvious reasons. I saw Cobalt's flight plan. A chief. I saw it. They changed it! The chief's judgment was indeed true. Well, Cobalt team has indeed met their demise, confirming Master Chief's earlier warnings. However, Ackerson chooses to downplay the situation. It is revealed that he was utilizing Cortana to simulate Reach's survival in the event of a Covenant attack. Despite being aware of the Covenant's presence on Reach, Ackerson opts to keep this information under wraps to prevent any sort of panic. He believes there is no hope of victory and sees escape as the only option. His rejection of mass evacuation as futile makes his character seem like a blend of the mayor from Jaws and various Elon Musk-like characters depicted on screen. 
Unfortunately, Keyes refuses to yield to Ackerson's dark scheme and leaves him in frustration. He pledges to fight and die if needed, in order to protect the people of Reach. So I think we should take a small detour and talk about this evacuation which Admiral Keyes has held bent on. In the Halo games, the Winter Contingency is like a big emergency plan for the United Nations Space Command and kicks in when Covenant Forces shows up on a human planet or colony. Different things can trigger it, like if the Covenant mentions a human colony by name or if there's evidence of Covenant activity, like burns from their weapons. But of course, if there's an actual fight with the Covenant, there's a clear sign too, but Winter Contingency is a serious deal for the UNSC. It's the top priority when it comes to reporting and dealing with threats. In this scene, when Admiral Key suggests to using the Winter Contingency after finding out what happened to the Cobalt team, when he brings it up, it seems like they should start evacuating right away. Now, in Halo Reach, the video game that tells the story of the fall of Reach, the Winter Contingency term is used to show a big emergency happening and has been used in other Halo games and stories too. Plus, Reach is a key part of the Halo story because it is a human planet under attack by the Covenant and is really important because it's the last defense before the Covenant reaches Earth. Even in Halo Infinite, they use the term Winter Contingency again, but this time it's for a holiday-themed operation called Winter Contingency 3. So for the gamer fans, this would be a fun nod to hear the term even though it's much more serious in the show. When Admiral Keyes realizes Master Chief was right about the Covenant being on Reach and killing Cobalt Team, he suggests starting the Winter Contingency and evacuating everyone from Reach, but Ackerson strongly disagrees and tells Keyes that their bosses already know about the Covenant invasion on the ground. The plan is to let the invasion happen quietly without telling the public. While this might help people like Ackerson and Keyes escape, it means lots of civilians will get hurt. It is clear the UNSC and Ani think Reach is a lost cause. Plus, Ackerson might even want to use the conflict as an example, especially since he covered up the Covenant's activities on Reach and kept Silver Team grounded. When? Exactly. Did you leave Pony? Master Chief realizes he cannot trust anyone. So Master Chief catches up with his former commander, Admiral Parangonsky, at a restaurant to share new information about the Covenant's presence on Reach and the lack of response from the UNSC or Ani. He really had high hopes that she would listen, but Margaret advises him to stick to protocol, which disappoints him. She even reminds the Chief to follow orders from his superiors and not go against Ani. When he tries to leave, the Chief realizes Parangonsky is still loyal to Ani, and the restaurant is filled with her team of agents. It seems Margaret wanted Master Chief to stay within the UNSC as her insider. However, given the urgency of the situation, Master Chief isn't interested in playing it safe anymore, and he almost ends up in another fight but decides to walk away once again. Ackerson serves Halsey the axe. So Ackerson pays a visit to Dr. Catherine Halsey in her holographic prison cell to say goodbye before the Covenant takes control of Reach. Ackerson attempts to undermine Catherine Halsey's resolve by informing her of his departure from Reach, taking her work on the Spartans with him. He feigns sadness, suggesting that it's unfortunate that she won't be alive to witness what he plans to do with her contributions and how it will contribute significantly to the war effort. However, Halsey turns the tables by revealing that she recognizes the red-headed girl they repeatedly show her dying as Ackerson's late sister Julia. She reveals that Julia was chosen for the Spartan augmentation process, but didn't survive it, and it was actually Ackerson who put his sister through that. Halsey even adds a cutting remark, mentioning that she also told Julia she would be a part of something bigger, and mentions how Julia spoke about her love for her brother. But sadly, in her dying moments, it was Halsey who comforted her. Clearly affected by this dig, Ackerson has Soren brought into the cell as a cruel parting gesture, leaving the former Spartan to grapple with his conflicted emotions towards her while they are locked in. The end clarifies a lot of things. So, Lyra is being interrogated by Sorin's crew who are hunting for a payoff. She exposes the absence of any treasure and attempts to manipulate the pirates against each other, highlighting their pursuit of power and their tendency to betray one another. Though her tactics somewhat succeeds, Lyra still ends up trapped in an airlock with a countdown to being ejected into space. Fortunately, Quan intervenes, ruthlessly killing the pirates and saving Lyra's life. Together, they take back Sorin's ship and set course for Reach to reunite with Kessler, in order to rescue Soren. On the other hand, Ackerson pays a final visit to his father to bid him goodbye. 
Despite facing the end, the older Ackerson remains calm, especially when his son fulfills his promise to grant him a peaceful exit. James provides his father with a poison pill and leaves him with one of the Julia clones he created, bringing the old man solace and making sure he has a known face to look over him as he slips away. Though I'm not particularly fond of Ackerson's character given that I will always root for the chief, I must admit this scene is truly heart-wrenching. Finally, at the end of Halo Season 2 Episode 3, Master Chief encounters Talia Perez in a chapel where they have a serious conversation about their experiences during the battle on Sanctuary. Perez confirms Chief's sightings of Maquis and the Fog, validating his concerns. She also reveals that she has been haunted by the Covenant signal from Sanctuary, which she has finally decoded. The message is a chilling covenant prayer, foretelling the annihilation of the people of Reach as an offering to their gods and promising that killing the demon, which is the Master Chief, will unlock the way to the sacred Halo Ring. It ends with a montage depicting the various characters featured in the episode, Riz and Louise relaxing, Ackerson fleeing the planet following the deaths of his father and Julius clone, Vadek contemplating whether to join Chief's mission, and more. As the episode concludes, the windows of the chapel shatter, signaling the beginning of the Covenant attack as Master Chief and Perez take cover as the chaos ensues. I'm both excited and terrified for what's to come on Reach and how each character will confront the Covenant threat in their own way in the upcoming episodes. How about you guys? What do you guys think of the show so far? Let us know in the comments below. And if you like the content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.